Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, set a date to run away with Mickey and Minnie, unexpected price increases, more chances to hang out with the plaids. Another Wakandan moves into DCA, a peek into holiday festival foods. We finish our interview with Imagineer Greg Combs and more. DL Weekly starts now. This is your captain speaking to you from the wheelhouse. I'd like to welcome all of you aboard the DL Weekly podcast. For safe passage on our trip, please do not sit or climb on the outside railings. And be sure to watch your children. The water can be unpredictable in these parts, and we'd sure hate to lose any of you. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of October 12th, 2022. I'm Teresa Urban. And I'm Teg Bushman. We'd like to send a shout out and a big thank you to Ann D for becoming an official weekly tier on our Patreon. Our supporters get some pretty fun perks like DL Weekly swag, bonus content, access to our Discord community, and more. If you would like some more Disney magic in your day, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support to join the community. Well, our friends over at All Enchanting Ears have been busy. They are making fun and unique ears, plus ear holders, straw toppers, lithophanes, and so much more. They are offering a special discount code available to weekly tiers. Be sure to use code DEALWEEKLY for 10% off your entire purchase. Head on over to allenchantineers.com and check them out. Now let's get to the news. Well, the kickoff to Disney's 100th anniversary will be centered at Disneyland. To begin with a bang, Disneyland announced the opening date of Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. Starting January 27th, guests will be able to take a trip through the El Capitoon Theater with Mickey and Minnie. Now the rest of Mickey's Toontown is not going to open just yet. Just the attraction will open on January 27th. So this is interesting. Like, I want to talk about the attraction itself, but the first thing that I thought of is... Well, this is, I mean, it's sort of near the front of Toontown. You have like a one little path. Yeah, right? one little path. A little that's straight gonna be, shot to the back there. That's going <laughs> to be done. I was not expecting this to open this soon. I thought no. it wasn't going to open until all of Toontown. Yep. And the last time we saw any type of aerial or anything, video or photos of this, like there was, there's not a Toontown really. Yeah. Last time we saw a Toontown, it was Dirt Town. Yeah. Dirt Town. <laughs> dirt Town, yeah. Mickey's Dirt Town. Mickey's Dirt Town. I'm very excited for this. I This was unexpected, but it's so exciting. And we had heard rumors that the attraction itself was pretty close to being done. And really, the they were just finalizing and finishing up a lot of the facade work. But, I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense because that big, big building has been up for quite some time now. So, And they can work on that 24-7. It doesn't matter because even when Toontown was open, it wasn't, you know, in the building. So it wasn't like it was interfering or doing anything that messed with, like, with guests. Whereas Toontown itself has not had as much time. Plus, quite literally, they're working from the ground up on some of those areas. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really exciting. What a way to start the Disney 100 Mm -hmm. by opening this attraction I feel early Mm because I hadn't heard any whispers that this might Mm -mm. even be a thing until they announced that it was happening. And I will say, even in the Disney Parks blog post, they said it's going to open early for that. So I was like, that's cool. The thing that I'm most excited about with this attraction is we rode it in Disney World. It was a great attraction. There's supposed to be a couple new things just for the Disneyland version. Mm -hmm. So very excited for that to happen. Well, and I'm just excited because when we rode it at Walt Disney World, it was the fall of 2020. So they didn't have some of the things in the Mm. queue that were supposed to happen happening. So we didn't get to experience the full storyline that is you in the queue and then you getting kind of pulled into the movie. We didn't get to experience that part. Right. So, and that I heard is a very, like to see that effect in person is like amazing. Yeah. Like people like look at it and are like, how, how, like, are perplexed. So would that be how it worked? Would that be like with Rise if you didn't go on the ship and you just walked in and suddenly you were on the hangar bay? Sure. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah I can see of. that being I'm excited. Like I'm a excited. Good story point. Well, not only will Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway open for the celebration, but the icon of Disneyland, Sleeping Beauty Castle, will also see a makeover. The castle will celebrate wonder with platinum banners and bunting and accented with the three 
good fairies. One of the most exciting upgrades will be two majestic water fountains on either side of the moat. Finally, a wishing star will sparkle atop the main kind of center large roof section of the castle. This, I'm really excited to see what this looks like in person. The concept artwork that they have actually is really quite convincing. It's not, it almost looks like a photo. Like the, it doesn't look like our traditional concept art. It almost looks like, oh, they installed this stuff, took a picture and then took it all down. So I think you, we get a really good feel and look as to what this is going to look like. But the thing I'm the most excited about, which is the funniest, weirdest things is the fountains. I'm so excited for these fountains. I think they're going to really, really add to the look of the castle, even though it's, it's not technically the castle, it's the moat. And the other thing that I find real fun is I like that they have incorporated the three good fairies Mm -hmm. into the main kind of bunting banner there. So you've got Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether holding that up. I thought that was a really fun touch, especially given that it's Sleeping Beauty's castle. You couldn't get away with doing that at Cinderella's castle as well. Right. One of the things that I really enjoy about this is we just got this castle renovated not that long ago with the new paint scheme that looks amazing in person, especially. And my concern is usually when they do these kind of decorations, they put stuff on top of those turrets and stuff, Mm -hmm. which causes them to have some damage because weather and stuff gets under there. It's not easy to clean off, etc. This time, they're doing all of this kind of bunting. They're adding a couple little things up at the top that are that are kind of like accent pieces that are not covering up the natural yeah. beauty yeah. of the castle and really just kind of accentuating. But I'm with you. These fountains, mm-hmm. I am beyond excited for these fountains because... I believe this will be something that stays I, after yeah. the bunting comes I down. Think so too. Now, I've been to Disneyland Paris, and Disneyland Paris, they have water jets in their moat like World of Color, mm-hmm. like Fantasmic. So I'm almost wondering if they're going to add or have any type of ability to do anything there that might go along, or these fountains, just as they are in the photographs here, might go along and be part of the fireworks show. Yep. Which will be really neat. I think you could do that with the fountains as they are. I do as much as I would like to be able to have these turn into like mist screens. I think with how Oh no, I don't mean mist screens. I mean like like world of color where they like shoot up oh, high and stuff. That kind of fountain. And they Got turn it. colors and Got everything. It. I thought you meant like like no, 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 no. Screen, like how the fountain turned into mist. I'm sorry. Okay. I I can see why you would have thought that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can I can see that to a degree. They wouldn't be able sure. to be quite as intense because those no. pools aren't that big, so they could very easily over <laughs> overshoot. The whole hub is a splash area. <laughs> yep. Yep. Anyways, I I'm really excited. I think it's going to be very. It's it's nice because it's just it's like an enhancement of the castle. Oh it's yeah. It's not like it's being taken over or something like that. Yeah, that's a great way to put it cuz I th- I agree with you that it's it's adding to not overwhelming the castle. Well, this isn't something that's very exciting to report on, but it is something relevant. Unfortunately, ticket prices have gone up yet again. They went up this Monday. On average, the ticket prices increased $5 this time. There is an additional tier of tickets, though, which moves the previous ticket levels down. So they now start at tier zero, which was the old tier one. Pricing has remained $104 for the new zero tier ticket and increased to $179 for the tier six level, up $15 from last time we raised prices. Adding park copy now costs $5 more at $65 per ticket. Multi-day tickets went up between $30 and $35 per ticket, and preferred parking and hotel valet parking has gone up $5 and $15 respectively. Genie Plus is now $25 per day, and they have implemented demand-based pricing with no high-end price announced for the service. However, good news! Web Slingers is now a normal Genie Plus attraction and is not a per-experience lightning lane like it was before. I mean, that's a plus. Uh, I just think the demand kind of wasn't there for it. Well, you know what, though? I saw quite a few people in that line. So I I, I think what they may have decided to do there was Disneyland currently has one paid lightning lance rise of the resistance. Right. Whereas DCA had two. That always felt a little weird off kind of uh, uneven to me. But I mean, what do I know? Yeah. Ticket prices. Not too bad per thing. No. We've talked about this at length on the show. I feel like they should leave ticket prices where they are and increase the Genie Plus price by a lot to kind of uh, make some money there and kind of deter some use of it 
which we've talked about at length. Yeah. So we just had a good question in the chat. Tara asked, what is demand based pricing? So prior to this ticket increase, Genie Plus, no matter what day, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks, 20 bucks. Yep. Did not matter if it was the busiest day of the year or the absolute slowest day of the year. Did not matter if you were the only person buying Genie Plus or if you were one of million, not millions, but you know, one of one of the thousands and thousands sure. that bought it. Whereas demand based pricing could mean a couple of different things. It could mean higher. How do I want to say this? Higher or higher or more popular days could see higher pricing for the Genie Plus service, or it could be based on that day's usage. If nobody's buying it, they're not going to raise the price. But if they have a surge in people buying it, they might raise the price up. Basically, my thought is they're going to be doing this to try and somewhat have some control on leveling out how many people are using it. They have not said that there's a cap. I think that's really what they need to look at is doing a cap. If it were up to me, if I was in charge of the Disney universe, Hmm. I would have raised Genie Plus by a heck of a lot more because I really do think that Genie Plus needs to be a premium price and it needs to be a premium service. So if I were in charge, I would have raised it to 50, 75 bucks per person per day. Does that sound steep? Oh, yes, that definitely (laughs) is steep. But my thought is you have you give have fewer people using those lightning lanes that not only makes the the value of genie plus go up because right now if you're going for your lightning lane reservations sometimes like han and mansion holiday that lightning lane line is spilling out into splash mountain it's a crazy long line so you're not really getting you're not you don't really feel like you're skipping the line per se you're just waiting in a a line, line but it's different whereas if it were more tightened if you had fewer people using lightning in, then you truly would be walking to the front yeah. of the line that might be something that would be worthwhile to some people to pay that extra huge price however the bigger plus that i would be more excited about is less people in lightning lane means better movement for the standby yep. lane because you're not having to pause and wait for all these people to go past so i really think it'd be a better balancing of yeah. of the system if they were to do that. Now, I know that's probably not the most popular thought process, but that's if I were in charge, that would be what I would do. Yeah, no, I agree with you. So our friends over at Concierge, James, one of the concierge over there, uh, in our chat earlier, talked about the variable pricing. So they haven't disclosed what that's going to look like at Disneyland, but currently at Walt Disney World Resort, GD Plus guests, the price will vary based on the date a guest is visiting. Similar to theme park tickets throughout the year, prices may be lower on less busy days and higher during peak periods like Thanksgiving and Christmas. For example, now through the end of October, prices are $15 per guest per day really? on less busy dates and $22 on some of our busier dates and somewhere in between on other dates. Plus tax, prices subject to change beyond October, etc., etc. That's et cetera, et cetera. surprising that Walt Disney World's Genie Plus is... It's been cheaper. Below what our Genie Plus is. No, theirs has been 15 really? when ours has been 20. Really? Yep. That's it's been that way since it launched. So that's very surprising to me. Well, Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is not immune from inflation and price increases either. Building a droid at the Droid Depot will now cost $119.99 plus tax, an increase of $20. Savi's Workshop was also increased the cost to build a lightsaber to $249.99 plus tax, an increase of $30. This is what a what a fun middle part of our discussion. We're talking about <laughs> prices going up on things. And here's Teresa talking about wanting prices to go even higher on other yeah, things. Yeah, right. But, you know, I, I'm not terribly surprised by this because it's really, you know, you're paying, yes, for the product, but also the experience. I, I do think that the Savi's price increase makes more sense to me than the droid price increase. I feel like $119 or $120 plus tax for building your own droid that just feels a little steep to me since it's not quite it's not quite the same experience yeah as as you get when you go to Savi's to build your lightsaber to build a droid for those of you that haven't stepped foot in the droid depot it it's just kind of this little separate area in the shop that is kind of like this little conveyor belt sure cast member kind of wanders around and kind of helps you out but it's very you kind of do a lot of it yourself. Yeah. You know, it's not like someone's really guiding you through the process. And it's where, plastic. Yeah. Whereas the 
Now I haven't done it, so Tay can speak to this <laughs> better than I can. But whereas building your own lightsaber, why, yes, you are still technically putting, you know, putting the pieces together and doing that part yourself. They really kind of, it's a very, it's a much more immersive experience to be able to get in there. You have to have the reservation and you can only bring one guest with you. It's a very like sought after thing because it's, it's behind this wall and you can't right. go pay, you know, that whole thing. And they make it. It's kind very, of a show. Yeah. It's very immersive. Like people get emotional and like, just talk about how, awesome the experience of it is yes of course they're excited about their lightsabers too but i feel like you're paying more for the experience right. than you are for the actual saber yeah but also like i said so with the droid you're you're building these smaller kind of droids they're made out of plastic where your lightsaber is made out of like metal and you get like there's, there's a lot of electronics too, and yeah. stuff yeah but i just feel like the bulk of it, it feels solid, you know, like sure, like sure. You, like a quality item. And and like you said, it's kind of the experience of going in and having this. You have a couple cast members that are helping you out. You have this show that kind of goes very, on. Very well themed. And, all and I've said in the past that the old pricing of one ninety nine ninety nine is worth it just for the experience. I do feel like now we're getting into the quarter of the way to a thousand dollars and it's kind of. Uh, yeah. So I think if they increase it any much further from this. There'll be less people that are going to be able to do it. However, I'm also surprised by even the old pricing, how many people had lightsabers mm -hmm. walking around. So apparently it's not deterring enough people from it, but uh, it's just kind of sad. We're having some inflation things. Maybe maybe things will go down in the future. Who knows? But definitely it's not encouraging me to build a droid in the future. Well, on to some more fun news. One of the last remaining things that went away with the beginning of the pandemic has finally returned. Guided tours have come back to Disneyland. Currently, Walt's Main Street Story Tour and Holiday Time at the Disneyland Resort Tours are open for booking. Walt's Main Street Tour includes a walking tour down Main Street, a visit to Walt's apartment, refreshments on the patio of his apartment, photo pass downloads, and a commemorative lanyard. The tour lasts 90 minutes and it's $160 per person. The holiday time tour is two and a half hours long and looks at the holiday traditions with a special viewing area for a Christmas fantasy parade, holiday treats, a ride on It's a Small World holiday, and more. This tour is $110 per person. I am so excited tours are back because I took, I've only taken one tour at Disneyland and it was the Walk and Waltz Footsteps tour and it was amazing. It brought me almost to tears. It was that good of a good of a presentation. I've learned a lot of cool things from it. For me, this Main Street tour sounds amazing because the price of admission for me is worth it to get up into Walt's apartment. So they didn't they didn't do that in the no. Walt I went on the version. They changed it to later, but when oh. I went on it, they didn't. For a while, the Walk and Foot Walt's footsteps tour went up to the apartment, and you got to ride on the Lily Bell, and that was like Dang. this whole thing. Well, yeah. not anymore, but. For me, getting up into the apartment and being able to have refreshments on the patio. I think that's really cool. That's super really, cool. Really, really cool. Is it, a, is it a hefty dollar amount? Yes. But I do think, for me, it'd be worth it because this is an area that us Disney geeks, you know, kind of, it's like one of like the things on all of our Disney bucket lists. And I just think it'd be so cool to be up there. And same thing with the Lily Bell. Now, one of the, we don't have a tour right now that includes the Lily Bell. Mm -hmm. So I think really the only way you might be able to get on there is through some Disney magic from a cast member, or it might be something you could do if you were doing a VIP tour, they sure. might be able to make that happen for you. But I'm really excited that tours are back. It's cool to me that they came back with new tours. So if you had, done the previous tours before this is still something for you to get yeah. excited about would i have liked to see the walk in waltz footstep tour come back yes of course i would have because i did not get to experience that but i do think the waltz main street story tour sounds incredible because i mean main street's one of those areas that is so amazing and there's so many details and there's so many little hidden things and there's so much history there but we're all guilty of it. We just kind of blow past it because mm -hmm. it's just kind of the hallway to get to the other thing. So I think it'd be really interesting to take the time to really stop and appreciate the details and appreciate the story and appreciate the history that Main Street has. And to have somebody that's knowledgeable in all this to kind of share and point this out. 
Absolutely. And like I said, it was really amazing. I'm just looking here because I thought I wanted to double check because previously, if you had an annual pass, it did allow you to use a discount on that. I heard that that's not a thing anymore. Well, that's what I'm looking. I'm going through the booking process quick. And it does not look like uh, I'm logged into my account. It does not look like it is using the discount. So it does not look like any type of magic key discount works on the tour now. I do think, again, I have not been on either of these. These are brand new tour. Well, the holiday one, I think, is one that they had before or a version of it. This Waltz Main Street tour is brand new. If it's anything like the tour that they had before, I think it's totally worth it. I think so. Well, and I think it sounds like you get to spend quite a an amount of time up in the apartment mm-hmm. and on the patio, too. So that's cool. And this is the first time that guests have been able to visit the apartment and hang out on the patio with refreshments. Yeah. So that's kind of a big thing. A big thing is, of course, guests have been able to visit the apartment before, but to hang out on the patio while enjoying refreshments. So cool. I think future visits. Something something on our, some new thing to add to your Disney bucket list, because I know it's on mine now. (laughs) Now, the question is, we, we want to go in the holiday time. Is this holiday tour something we would consider? Maybe, yeah. And you know, that one doesn't seem, price point wise, 110 doesn't feel as for as two and a half hours. Deep as 160 for the 90 minutes. So mm-hmm. I'm curious about that one. I really am. Well, more new characters are coming to Avengers Campus in Disney California Adventure. Mbaku will make his appearance soon from Black Panther, who will be in the new Black Panther Wakanda Forever movie. Werewolf by Night from Disney Plus has two characters that are visiting. Jack Russell in his werewolf form and Elsa Bloodstone both come out after dark. So I am not familiar with the Werewolf by Night Me characters either. yet because I have not watched it yet. So I, I'm not, I don't know much about Jack Russell and Elsa Bloodstone. But what I will say is the photos that I have seen. Ooh, he looks creepy. And it makes perfect sense that they're introducing this character during like the Halloween and spooky season because Jack Russell is a werewolf and he like kind of comes out, there's fog and they have these lights kind of lit up on him. He just looks, ooh, he looks he spooky looks and creepy. Scary. He does not look like someone you would meet in a Disney park. We'll no. That way. But I am really excited about M'Baku and I'm just in general, very, very excited about the new Black Panther movie, Wakanda Forever. So I'm just excited to see. I just love that we're getting these. I know I say this every time (laughs) we talk about new characters coming to the park, but I just love this. I love that even though I haven't watched Werewolf by Night, that the characters are already there. And M'Baku, we met in the Black Panther movie, Mm. but, you know, he's going to become, he's going to be, in the new one, Wakanda Forever, also. So it's almost it's almost like we're getting him in the park before we get to see him on the screen again. So I just I just find it really fun and really exciting. I'm just I'm very happy about this. Yeah. I I love the synergy that Disney is doing with Disney Plus and their things and Avengers Campus. Um, we're starting to kind of get a little bit of that with Galaxy's Edge as well. I wish they would have done this from the beginning with Galaxy's Edge, but I'm glad we're getting it now. Mm-hmm. And I love that we finally, and I, you know, it's been a while, but I'm just glad that we finally are back fully to having characters and stuff in the park. Because remember, it wasn't yeah. that long ago where we had distanced meet That's and true. greets and all these other things. So it's really great that we have this stuff in the park. So just keep bringing them is what I say. <laughs> Well, there was a special event this past Sunday near Disneyland that was perfect for Halloween Disneyland fans. An Oogie Boogie afternoon was held at the Frida Cinema in Santa Ana and went behind the scenes of the popular Halloween After Hours event with Imagineers. Disney Live Entertainment and Walt Disney Imagineering were on hand to talk about the event, the Oogie Boogie Bash. Afterwards, guests were treated to a special screening of A Nightmare Before Christmas. I'm so upset that I didn't (laughs) know about this and that I don't don't have some quick instant transportation that could have gotten me there because this sounded so up my alley and so amazing. If you were fortunate enough to be one of the people to attend this event, you need to email us and Mm. please tell me all about how amazing it was. The thing that was also incredible, general admission for this event was $30. That's not bad. Steal. That's an absolute steal. I'm so glad 
you know, you and I are both, and I assume listeners of this podcast are fans of behind the scenes things oh, and learning yeah. about things. So the fact that they have something like this is really amazing. I didn't know about it until I was writing the script this evening. And I'm also sad that we did not get this. Maybe next year they'll have another similar thing, or maybe they'll have more stuff. If it was successful, maybe we'll have more stuff like this about other aspects of the Disney parks. I do know. I was not aware of this event until I was on my Facebook aimlessly scrolling through (laughs) and all of a sudden one of our listeners stephanie f was posting stuff about this and i was like what is this it looks so amazing there was she go she went she did she went there was also another incredible event this year it was a charity event for the garner holt foundation hosted at garner holt productions which is his basically his version of imagineering and his right you know willy wonka and the chocolate factory like magic chocolate it's like getting a golden ticket to go in there yes because as you know garner holt does garner holt production is responsible for a lot of our favorite animatronics including murphy aka the dragon in phantasmic as well as many many others that are in disney parks as well as other parks around the world so but this event this charity event had all sorts of disney voices you got a tour of the like production floor in the his his factory. Yeah. Um. Bob Gurr was there. I mean, there were just tons, tons and tons and tons of Disney like Disney amazing people were at this event, and that looked incredible. That was on Saturday, so this was a like a m- incredible weekend for Disney fans in the Southern California area to have been able to experience these things. Not to be fair, you were out of town. I was out of doing town. other fun stuff. Oh yeah, that was not Disney related, but. So it's not like you were sitting at home missing all of no, this. No, but still it was just doing something. super incredible opportunities. And I'm very happy for anyone that was able to experience one or maybe even both of these events. But wow. just just amazing. And I told Teresa, I said, you know, if we lived in Southern California, these type <laughs> of things would be so easy. I, Yeah. Tis the season to start thinking about your holiday dining in the park. Disneyland announced nine returning food booths for the Festival of the Holidays in Disney California Adventure, including Visions of Sugar Plums, which is back for the first time since 2018. No menus have been announced, but we're looking forward to all of the details. Oh, I'm looking so forward to these menus because they're always such a unique and fun twist on things. There's not Mm -hmm. too many like, oh, yeah, it's just... Regular old mac and cheese over here, and oh, here's sure. a hot dog. It's always something fun and something festive and something unique. I guess yeah. would be a good way. All to of the food it. things are kind of like that. I feel, mm-hmm. and that I, that's what makes these food events so exciting to me. Is that it's it's something different, and there are things that I get to try here that maybe I wouldn't get to try normally. So, or maybe something that. I didn't even know would be a thing like like merry mashups, you know, who knows what they're going to put together next, that sort of thing. So I'm very I'm very excited to see what the new menus will be for the food booths this year. So a twist on tradition features favorite holiday foods with a twist, kind of like Teresa was saying. Brews and bites features, well, brews and bites. <laughs> right. Uh, favorite things are features holiday classics infused with a festive kick. Grandma's Recipes, which features time-honored dishes. Holiday Duets, featuring perfectly paired savory foods. That sounds almost Mary (laughs) Poppins-like. Making Spirits Bright is featuring different holiday beverages. You could get some flavorful cuisine with a hearty flair at Merry Mashups. Winter Sliderland features savory sliders. They they were the one that had that really good, like, steak slider Ooh, now you're making me hungry (laughs) and then finally of course visions of sugar plums which has sweet and savory treats so that is the return they're they're all returning booths but this one is returning for the first time since 2018 so Mm -hmm. how very exciting so we have reported on this before but a new feature will help you find your car in the disneyland app so when you park at the disneyland parking area this can now tag your aisle and section in the Disneyland app. The service is presented by State Farm and is available now. That's exciting. Yeah, we've talked about this before. Yeah, we reported on this back when they announced it, but the exciting thing is... It's finally there. Yes. Well, let's end on some excitement that's that's Disney-related, but not necessarily at the Disneyland Resort. Encanto has come to New York City for a limited time. Camp, the family experience company, and Disney have joined forces to put on the experience. Disney Encanto X Camp is a six 
thousand square foot experience wow. inspired by the film and transports guests into Encanto. The experience is an hour long and includes the courtyard, a climb up to Antonio's room and a rainforest adventure, a spin through Isabella's flower filled room and more. Never before seen areas like Luisa and Peppa's rooms and oh. Dolores's soundscape door. Tickets can be purchased at the link in the show notes. This looks so, so cool. So immersive. Again, if anybody's able to go and experience this, please let us know what you think. This, I mean, you know who I it's think it's like stepping into the movie. It's you know so who I so neat. Think would do something like this. So, supporter Dave. Oh yeah, lives in the Pacific Northwest, and he likes. He just did this again just the other day. If it was was it today or yesterday, one yeah. of the two. He's like, well. I have a reservation for tomorrow. I'm going to go fly down. He lives really close to the airport. He's got mm-hmm. all types of airline miles. So he was explaining this to us and he just pops on down. So I'm wondering if after listening to this episode, I don't know how big of an Encanto fan he is, but I could see him hopping over to New York to <laughs> check out this experience. That's not, perhaps. Yeah, that's not as quick of a flight as no. it is down to California, but man, it might be worth it just to see this. It looks so fun. I think the thing that's most intriguing to me about this is that we get to see some of these characters' rooms that we didn't get to see before. So like Luisa's room. Mm -hmm. We only ever saw her running outside of her door. And same thing with we got a little bit of a sneak peek of a corner of Peppa's room when she was um, when Mirabelle was like in the wall. Oh, sure. But we didn't actually get to see the full room. So I think I just think that is so this looks this just looks amazing. Um, I'm trying to figure out because they said that it'll be there for a limited time and then it will move to another Ooh. camp location near you. And I don't know where these camp locations are. So Fifth Avenue, Boston, Brooklyn, Columbus Circle, Dallas, Hudson Maybe Yards, I'm Los like... Angeles, New Jersey, and South Norwalk. Mm. Mm. No, nowhere close to us. But... No, I was hoping for like a Chicago or a Minneapolis. Yeah. Because that would be really cool. But uh, such a neat thing. Yeah. How did you even come across with this? Because this was the Disney Parks blog. Yeah, the Disney Parks blog announced this. So very, very fun. Very cool. Pilots, we've detected some producer questions near Jakku. Report to your DL Weekly vessels and make the jump to hyperspace. The 7-7 Squadron will provide support during your trivia mission. Good luck, and may the Force be with you. Welcome to Trivia Land. How are we feeling tonight? You got some great answers stored up in your head? You ready for this? I just, you know, I just never know what we're getting into when it comes to Trivia Land. So. Me either, but I, for some reason, feel in a good mood and optimistic tonight. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm feeling good for you, too. I think okay. the listeners have sent some good ones, but some doable ones for you. Good. So. So let's see what the listeners got for you tonight. Excited to prove you wrong. (laughs) Your first question submitted by listener Chris Y. What is the name of the pirate in Pirates of the Caribbean who offers rum to the cats? Isn't that from the movie? Like it's, uh, oh God, what's his name? I don't know. I genuinely, I do not know. It's um, not Higgins. Mr. Mr. Not Tibbs. Mr. Not in the movie. What? It's just it's kind of a, an accepted lore of the ride. I'm going to call oh, him well here then. Kitty Kitty. I don't know then. See, you've already we've already proven you wrong. Yeah. Do you have a hint or is that just it? Um, It's a descriptor and a common name. Harry? Is it Drunk Pete? That would be a descriptor and a common name. I'm going to say oh, Drunk Pete. I thought Pete. you meant it was like all in one. Like Harry is a, a descriptor. Oh of no! But that, <laughs> that, 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 that is a that that is a way to interpret what I said. Yes, <laughs> I'm gonna say drunk Pete. Drunk Pete. All right. Because why not? So a descriptor and a common name, Teresa. I'm gonna say drunk Dave. Well, we've all agreed that he's drunk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Drunk Pete and drunk Dave. Final answers. Yes. All right. Your second question submitted by Keith N. What is a common cast member nickname for the Main Street vehicles? Common nickname? Mm. For all, like, as as a group? Yes. I thought you said this was going to be an easy week. Yeah, right? I... Hmm. I don't know. You know what this is? This is one of those questions... That we're not going to have an answer for, but when he tells us the answer, we're going to kick ourselves. I genuinely don't know if I've ever heard this before. This isn't even like 
tickling a I don't know. I'm dark say, corner of my brain. I don't like, think it's right, but hurt. the only word that comes to mind is funiculars. I don't think that's even anything. Funiculars? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm wrong, but at least I'm throwing something out there. I feel like in two questions, you're going to have some word spill wheels. into your head. I don't know. The wheels. The wheels? The wheels. I, I absolutely know. Funiculars idea. and the wheels. Final answers? Sure. Very sad final answers. <laughs> All right. And your third regular round question submitted by listener Louise B. In the Haunted Mansion Holiday Overlay, what replaces Madame Leota's musical instruments and how many objects are there? They're musical tarot cards, aren't they? No, those are there normally. So there's the musical instruments are swapped out with like playing cards. So it's got like Jack's the king, Sally's the oh, queen. Playing cards, huh? They're like yeah, they're like cards or maybe like tarot cards. You I don't know, I don't know. I but yeah, they're cards. Okay. Mm, I'm going to say there's 13 just because it's Haunted Mansion. I think they're fortune cards because in the in the like in that section when she's talking, I think she says Something for my fortune card tree. And I oh, thought yeah. that, that she talks a about A star, them. a brilliant star. For my fortune card tree, but I'm wondering if those things are fortune cards. Hmm. I'm just going with cards. Yeah. Cards? Is that specific enough for you, Fern? You didn't give me a number, though. Yeah, you need a number. Of cards? Mm-hmm. Yep, I asked how many. Six. Definitely more than six. I didn't pay attention when we went through there because I'm always looking they're, at... Well, they're behind you. Because her, her ball looks like an ornament yep, for the her, holiday her, version. Okay. Her, um, yeah. Do you have so a number? We've yeah, 13. Got... Oh, 13. Oh, that would make sense. Are you going to change your number, Teg? I'll stay with six. Okay. So we've got but 13's Teg a great answer. saying six fortune cards and Teresa saying 13 Nightmare Before Christmas cards? No, I was just cards. Cards with yeah, Nightmare cards. Before Christmas characters, you said? Yeah, I think they have Nightmare Before Christmas characters on them. Because you mentioned Jack and Sally. Yeah. yeah. I didn't. Uh-huh. Did you? We can keep that in there. I thought I heard you say that. I, I did. No, but I didn't. I didn't. Did you or did I? I did. Say okay, that. okay. I, I, All right. I think, that, I think yep. Jack's on one. I think Sally's yeah. on one. Okay. All right. Final answers. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right. And your fourth and final regular round question from listener Cooper C. When was the Fred Gurley number no. three engine built, and what was its original job before coming to Disneyland? Lumber. That for some reason lumber. That, lumber. I think it pulled lumber. That sounds good to me. I'll I'll when concur with lumber. Was it built? Eighteen ninety three. That's what I'll say. I was gonna say eighteen. I'll say eighteen sixty three. Just to ooh. Be different. And you're both saying lumber. Yes. yes. Okay. So we have eighteen ninety three and eighteen sixty three and lumber. Correct. Okay. And your bonus question tonight. How much was the Fred Gurley number three purchased for? Oh, boy. In U.S. dollars. So was it more than $1? It was more than $1. Okay. And it was less than $1 billion. That is, that is, uh, that is, that is quite the range. You're welcome. I will say it was purchased for $7,000. I was going to say it was purchased for like 20. Thousand? Yeah. Or $20? 20, 20,000. Okay. Dang, this is hard trivia. All right, we have 7,000 and 20,000. Are those your final answers? Yes. All right. Well, listeners, how do you think they did? How did you do listening at home? Stick around until after the discussion topic, and we can all find out together. Well, this week for our discussion topic, we finish up our conversation with Greg Combs. Enjoy it. That brings up the the next thing that I was curious because you um, in your email to us you wrote some things you could talk about that was kind of philosophical and we talk about this all the time and I thought this would be a good good branch mm-hmm. into it is existing IP versus park specific oh. stories mm-hmm. right um, which kind of goes in what you're saying is you know from a from a from a standpoint of potential success if you have a movie that's really popular yeah. And then you've got this totally unknown story for something. It's like, well, which one are we going to put the money into? Right. Mm, you know, how hard is that? Or what, what's the what's the deal with that? Because us Parks fans want more 
parks kind of like non IP stuff, but it seems like Disney's going the safe route, I guess you could call it, and doing a lot of well, IP it's stuff. The pop- it's the popular route because well, that's true. you know, the vacationers are excited about meeting the Avengers or meeting, you know, like like Greg was Star saying, you know, where's Mickey and Minnie? You know, the 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 comfort of knowing what you're kind of gonna get yourself into versus the unknown of I'm sorry. Yep. Absolutely. Pirates, what? <laughs> you know, right? No, and, and look, it, God bless you all for <laughs> for <laughs> thinking that that park driven intellectual property or stories uh, are are better than stories that come from other mediums. But I mean, this is again is the challenge of a big company like Disney that is as successful at attracting top creative talent in all aspects of their business. So when you get these great storytellers who create amazing movies and TV shows and whether it be animation or live action, and you see that Disney name in the beginning of the movie. And as a guest, when you go to a Disney park, you're hoping to meet or see or experience those things that you experienced through that movie or that TV show, or however you first encountered that character, that story. And so I mean, how can you find fault with the company trying to say, yes, we we love these stories. We believe in these stories. We've invested in them. And we want the guests to be able to experience them in whatever way that they choose to experience. And so it's a little bit challenging. Now, you've seen also that pendulum go the other way where there's a lot of uh, media content being generated on park intellectual property. Right, so the movie version of Haunted Mansion or mm-hmm. Jungle Cruise or um, Pirates, even Pirates, right? But yeah, Pirates, I guess, is the most famous example. But I've sort of blocked that one out of my mind a little bit. But <laughs> that's a whole other set of stories. The first one was yeah. amazing, yeah. but yeah, oh, the first one was amazing. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I appreciate the spectacle of all of them. The first mm-hmm. one was certainly fresh and original and groundbreaking for so many reasons. Um, and there was there became an interesting synergy of back and forth between the ride and the movies. As the movie mm. would develop new ideas, we would try to incorporate that in the rides and vice versa. And so it it was really fun to to see that take place. But it's again, we're a victim of our own success. If we're gonna tell these stories and they're great stories and they're popular, how do we not put those mm. stories into our parks? Now Yes, I and, and there's a whole bunch of friends of mine that right now are busily going to scribble down notes and call me <laughs> and text me. <laughs> Greg, we talked about this. We know that we can tell these stories and that we can, you know, do these fantastic things, and and we can. And 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 certainly the company makes those opportunities available, but they also, you know, they don't have limited unlimited resources. Mm-hmm. They have to think about with each of the business units, how much money do you put into the theme parks versus the movies versus the TV shows versus whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And and so as they're looking to invest that money and you know you have a finite amount and you know you've got to move the needle a little bit, what's going to move the needle? A Star Wars story or a new story that a young Imagineer just came up with that nobody's ever heard of before? Well, Star Wars is kind of a no brainer. Right. I mean, can anybody find fault with us putting Rise of the Resistance in the parks? I mean, I think it's a groundbreaking attraction. It's mm-hmm. it's like nothing I've ever thought I would see. And and I applaud the company for taking the risk that it took to put that in the parks. Um, I don't begrudge them for a moment for for trying to do something like that. Um, well, and there's risk either way you go because right. you've got you know you've got either something that is an unknown right. so you have no idea how the audience is going to react to the unknown or right. you've got like star wars it's this big beloved thing that people again like we we're saying kind of hold up on this little mental right. pedestal in their head so you're like okay we got to try and meet if not exceed these expectations but what where's that expectation lie and then sure. then did we do it or not? You know, so I, I don't yeah. envy any of that no. decision making. Well, and, and, Every time, you know, it's easy to be a critic, but the people making the decision, I'm like, that's, oh, that's right. the hot seat. We, man. <laughs> we have this wealth of riches of stories now, yeah, right? Yeah. Cause you, you go back to the fifties and sixties there, there just wasn't that big of a catalog to pull from. That's right. True. I mean, there just 
weren't that many movies in the vault. There weren't that many stories that were already associated with Disney. And the ones that were, were out there. They were all there. So it, um, they had to create other stories. They had to, to create their own ideas. And now that the decades have gone by, and not only do we have all the Disney movies, but now we have the Marvel movies, <laughs> and we have the Star Wars movies, mm -hmm. we have this wealth of riches of fantastic stories and aspirational places that we all want to go to. We all want to be, be in the middle of these worlds and, and experience it. And yet still, you know, it's a publicly traded company that must, must answer, you know, to a board of directors and shareholders and say, yeah, we spent the money wisely. <laughs> we didn't, <laughs> we didn't do anything crazy. Right. We, we tried to do the right thing. And the thing, the thing that's interesting too, is there's worlds that the Imagineers have created that I didn't even know that I wanted to be a part of until <laughs> I stepped into it in the park. Pandora is that world for me. I right. did. Yeah. Like Avatar was not, I had seen it once, right. you know, it wasn't something that, you know, really, hit home with me like some of the other properties but that land Isn't that is incredible amazing? the people it's that incredible. did that are just are, are geniuses right mm -hmm. i think of you know that was joe Rody, obviously as the creative director for animal kingdom and, and for mm -hmm. that land but you know i think of a short for may rock work god right this guy and his his team of rock work people they just do amazing things mm -hmm. but not just the people that did the creative part think about the structural engineers that yeah. had to design the steel inside of those rock work formations to yeah make those stand up right mm -hmm. think about the people that had to make that ride system for you know the big attraction and the, you know the audio animatronic in the boat ride mm -hmm. I mean, just everything that goes into those the people that just astound me but they're with their abilities to tell these stories. And mm -hmm. yeah, Avatar, you know, at one time was the highest grossing movie ever, ever. And, and we got a couple more movies coming down the pike here soon. Yep. And so how do you not as Disney, when you have the ability to present those stories into a theme park environment, how do you not do that? You, you'd be silly. You'd be criticized if you didn't do it. So I want to venture into... Greg opinion land real quick. <laughs> I, I thought that's where we've been for the last hour. I thought we were oh, there. No, no. These are, these are, uh, I just want to be clear for our listeners and, and, and any Disney people who might be listening that, <laughs> that, that I'm interested in your opinions, not the, not the company's thoughts on these things or any inside knowledge so, that you have on it. Greg's opinion as a fan. Yes. That's okay, I'm retired now, so I can say these things, right? I'm, you know, I'm we gonna, joke. I'm going to get a. I'm going to get a call from HR. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> we we joke because there was one of the times, like one of the very first times we talked to anybody who worked for Disney. We had, they had started to tell some story, and the Zoom or whatever we were using, it was probably Zoom connection, like froze. And Teresa mm -hmm. and I looked at each other. We said, "Disney's on to them. They're yeah. they're <laughs> they're cutting the connection." Yeah. Um. But I was curious, there, I have three general things. And the first one leads in from our pre just conversation a second ago. Mm. As somebody who's worked on attractions before, what do you like? What's your opinion of themed lands like a Tomorrowland, an Adventureland, a Fantasyland mm. versus a Galaxy's Edge, a Pandora, a Cars Land? Right. What, what do you campus. Th Avengers right, you're, campus. You're, you're talking about the difference between a land themed around an idea versus yeah. themed around a, a story and mm -hmm. a specific yes. story. Yes. Right. And I don't know. I love both. All right. I mean, I, I, I want to believe that there's a place for both. Mm -hmm. Now I say that and Tomorrowland has always been problematic, but problematic <laughs> for different reasons, right? Not because it's themed around an idea, but because the idea of creating a Tomorrowland, as soon as you create it, it's yesterday land, it, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we, I worked on a project that never saw the light of day. It was called Tomorrowland 2055. And we were going to level, essentially, not level is probably too strong a word, but we were going to completely redo Disneyland Tomorrowland. And we had... Woo! And the crowd goes wild. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> oh, and it, it was the Tony Baxter-led project, and oh. it, it was... You know, a lot of really brilliant people were working on it. I just and want to say quickly, this is airing after the D23 Expo. We might, <laughs> at this point when this airs, we might have a design for a new Tomorrowland, maybe. <laughs> or I seem completely crazy at this point. Uh, I, I can tell you 
ever since I've been with the company, there has always been people trying to reimagine Tomorrowland. I'm sure it's just They're, like the thorn in a lot uh, of Imagineers' sides. Like, we yeah. got to do something. Oh, There's so much potential. We're not dummies. So, I mean, we yeah. see it, right? We, yeah. we walk out there and we're like, uh, we'd like to be better, right? We'd like to do something. But then again, you you go back to that. I have a finite amount of money. I can only spend so much and I only have so much time. Where do I put it? And yep. and so Space Mountain's going to draw people no matter what, right? So you mm-hmm. you just go Space Mountain's great. How much am I going to mess with that? Um, the rest of it, you kind of go. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Star Wars, Star Tours was such a fabulous attraction for so long, but now that we have Galaxy's Edge and Rise of the Resistance and Millennium Falcon, you kind of look at Star Tours and go, should we keep it? Should we right. do something else? But, you know, the whole branching technology and and the additional stories they've been able to add, to me, I think have kept it fresh and kept it interesting and relevant. You just have to kind of make yourself good with the idea that those two different things exist. Um, but the, the idea of a land based on an idea as opposed to a specific location of fantasy land, adventure land, right? Uh, uh, frontier land, though frontier land is problematic in many other ways. Um, Tomorrowland. I love that uh, because I, I, what happens when you get a specific story, you know, and you theme around a story like Raider Springs or Galaxy's Edge or, you know, even some of the stuff that we did. Um, Mysterious Island is probably a good example in Tokyo Disney Sea. You've locked yourself in now. Mm-hmm. You, expansion, renovation, refreshing attractions, you're stuck. You have one story you're telling, and that's your story. And anything you want to do has got to fit that story. Mm-hmm. Where if I'm in Fantasyland, I can tell a whole bunch of different stories that fall under the auspices of fantasy. If I'm in Adventureland, Adventure, boy, that covers a whole bunch of stuff, right? And I, I can tell all kinds of stories in Adventureland. Tomorrowland, same thing. Mm-hmm. So the flexibility that a land that's based on an idea, as opposed to a specific place or story, I, I think it just makes sense to me. I love that. Um, it, as much as I, you know, I'm a big fan of the immersion of Galaxy's Edge. I'm a big fan of the immersion of Pandora. Um, those are beautiful, beautiful works of art, in my opinion. Um, you've locked yourself in. And, yeah. and and so the only thing to do if Pandora ever wears out, nobody wants to go there anymore, or if Galaxy's Edge wears out, nobody wants to go there anymore, you've got to scrape it and start over. Yeah. Right? That's my big concern is these are great Marvels, and everybody loves Star Wars and Marvel right now, but unlike something like the Jungle Cruise that's coming up on 70 years old, you know, are these still going to be popular 70 years from now? I mean, they could be, but we don't know. It just seems like a gamble. It it is, but, you know, it's a smart gamble because these are very strong stories. Pandora, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Star Wars, these are very, very strong stories. So they're going to... You know, don't feel sorry for them. They're going to make their money. They're going to do great. <laughs> They're yeah. going to, right? They're going to be very popular. And it, it it's only as a storyteller, as a designer, that I worry about it because you know when it comes times to refresh that, the company will be totally happy to refresh it. Uh, it'll just have to be something completely new, um, unless those stories continue to grow in other ways that allow them sure. to refresh and 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 tell something different using. Mm-hmm the same attractions and, yeah and same life. like i mean batu since they kind of lock they lock themselves in a you know the star wars universe but not at a specific point you know that right. they still have some flexibility there versus you know pandora right now is yes we're getting more movies but right now it's the one so, or like cars right. land you kind of you know it's it's a tighter lane but yeah so it'll be it i'm curious to see how you know what the longevity is of these but yeah, I mean, look yeah. at Cars Land. I, how old is Cars Land now? And it's still... 10 years. Just as popular, if not more, than well, the day it opened. You know, and, it's, and, a, it's and incredible. I, I chalked that up to that team. They did a yeah. beautiful job. By the way, again, that was Robert Coltrane, Kevin Rafferty, mm-hmm. creative director, show writer on Mayor Springs Racers. They just yeah. did a brilliant job on that. Yeah. The whole team that created the land, the placemaking, every aspect of that is just mm-hmm. it's spot on. You are in the movie. 
Yeah. And yeah. right. And and I just and I'm gonna give a shout out to my friend Ken Lennon, the line designer for that land. Ken creates oh, the gorgeous. moment at dusk <gasps> where all the lights come on. Teresa loves this. It, moment. it is the most magical moment as far as mm-hmm. I'm concerned. And so Ken did that. Um and I, I still sing his praises every time I, I get an opportunity because I you know, I, I don't know that people know to just put yourself in that land during that moment when the sun starts to set and those lights come on and they play the music and you're transported to that time in the movie when that happens. It's, Mm -hmm. it's magical. Teresa makes a point every trip. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for giving us a name to the person that's behind that magical moment. Cause it's just like you said, it's magical. And it's it's kind of like this insider secret. They don't advertise that it happens. Oh. So I can't I would love to somehow not have ever experienced it and be the guest that just happens to be in the land right. and have it happen like organically for me. That would just be like I mean, even the people that are standing there waiting, everyone just kind of just time stands still when that when the mm-hmm. lighting ceremony mm-hmm. happens. Yeah. It's, well, a, it's, it's so great and dark. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I wish that I wish that um, that there was more like twenty four hour days where where it was open because <laughs> I would love to just sleep during the day and just be in the park at night. No, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> I love Disneyland at night though. It's so beautiful. I I do too. But keeping the park open twenty four hours is yeah. is a horrible. Oh thing. no, I get that part. But I'm so saying like. Horrible. I just I I just want more nighttime time in the park. It never seems oh, when okay. I was going to the parks uh, when I was younger. It was back in the time when the parks would stay open till one a.m. and I loved that. Mm-hmm. But now it's like midnight's like they're cut off, and that's that. All right, yeah. Disney parks, especially in the United States, um, we we just uh, as we record this, we just found out about Magic Key stuff a couple days ago. Yep. Something mm-hmm. that I've been touting forever, and I want your opinion on if this will ever happen, is that Disney needs to create another U.S.-based Disney resort somewhere that has mm. parks because mm. they, have a, they have a demand issue, so they keep raising the prices and doing all this stuff because right. they say that right. we have a very popular product. Well, the only way to keep prices down and kind of spread that around would be to build another resort somewhere, right? right. Question mark? Um. Yeah, th- this is an area that, yeah, where I tread dangerously. <laughs> oh, an area, and well, no, it's an area that I really don't know. Sure, this I'm is why it's about, your opinion. Right? It's just my opinion. I, yeah. I but, but you know, th- there's really smart people who look at this, who go, "Where do you put a park?" Because think about it: our smallest park draws five million people annual, mm-hmm. right? Smallest. And you need to do at least that or more for it to become a viable venture, at least in the current business model of what a theme park is. Now, who's to say that Disney doesn't come up with a totally different type of experience? And we've tried, right? We've we've tried different things. If you think about, um, gosh darn it, I'm losing. I'm old, so I'm Disney Quest. Disney Quest, thank you. Thank you. God bless you. You read my mind. <laughs> Disney Quest was designed to be that, right? It was designed to be a, a smaller product that could pop up into different markets and not take people away from wanting to visit Disney World or Disneyland, but bring them a Disney experience. And for various reasons, it just wasn't successful. It didn't hit the mark. And and there were several, there was a thing called Club Disney that we played with in the 90s. Um uh, that didn't quite work out. Um, it, at some point, I'm going to bet they figure out a different product that isn't a full castle park, right? Mm-hmm. Because our entry into every market has been a castle park, right? So you you say that that's kind of a blueprint of success. You go into a market, you put a castle park in first, you see how that does, you expand it, and then and then see how far you can grow with it. If, if there's enough demand, you add another gate uh, and, and, and add something else to it. Um, there might be something else they think of for other markets where a castle park doesn't make sense. And, you know, as long as I was at Imagineering, there were always ideas floating around of what that could be. It's just that nothing really kind of caught fire, right? And made everybody go, yeah, that's the thing. Let's get behind that. 
But that's not to say it won't happen. You look at the people who are playing in location-based entertainment right now, and I'm not saying the big ones like Universal, right? I mean, Universal does fantastic work. But think about people like Meow Wolf. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with them, but they're a Santa Fe-based uh, arts collective who created this amazing experience in Santa Fe, and it caught fire, largely because of, of just the brilliance of who they are. But then they also kind of create a mix of art and theme park experience um, that is just it's very hard to describe in, in, in a conversation like this. I suggest you and your listeners check them out. They are kind of the new Disney. Um, they opened a Meow Wolf location in Las Vegas and Denver, and they, they are a very interesting experience. And it's those types of people who are experimenting with the idea of location-based entertainment and what that means and how you tell stories in, a, in an interactive experience um, that I think will push Disney to look at what they do and how they do things a little differently. Now, when you're as big as Disney, it's very hard to break the process of what you've always done, right? Because the machine gets created with that in mind, with the idea of we know how to do a theme park, let's do a theme park. We know how to do attractions, let's do that. We, we got into cruise ships, now we understand cruise ships. Okay, let's do cruise ships. We got that. Um, even resort hotels like Alani, right? You go, yeah, we know how to do a resort hotel. That's good. Um, it's hard to be nimble, though. It's hard to... You know, do that little small thing that then catches fire and grows into something big. But um, I wouldn't underestimate them either. I bet you they think of something. I just looked that up. We will have a link in our show notes for Meow Wolf. But yeah, that just the photos on their website are just very I, like intriguing. That's like, what I'll, is this? And, and and I'll give you a little bit more reason to check them out. Probably about, well, I, uh, I'll give you a number and it won't mean anything, but a large amount of their staff is ex Imagineers. Oh. oh. That's a great reason to go then. <laughs> there's a whole bunch of ex Imagineers working for them right now. But yeah. there's ex Imagineers doing really cool stuff everywhere, mm-hmm. right? So you think about the location based entertainment industry really took off when a whole bunch of Imagineers found themselves out of work in the 70s yeah. and 80s and went and started creating their own industry, their own business, and started doing things on their own. Now, Universal helped a lot and other mm-hmm. kinds of, of location experiences helped a lot. But um, you think about that industry that got created in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. Most people grew up and they all went on and did other things and continue to do other things. And while I still hold Disney as the platinum standard for all things theme park, location-based entertainment, they're going to be a hard one to knock off that pedestal. There's a whole bunch of people thinking about it, and there's a yeah. whole bunch of people playing in that industry right now trying to come up with the mm-hmm. next cool thing. And there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Yeah. Just at a different scale, right? I, I think that's good, though, because then it kind oh, of yeah. like, you know, then everybody's kind of just We love it. To, I mean, you know. From a Disney perspective, we love that stuff because yeah, it, yeah. it keeps us fresh. And we go mm-hmm. look at all of it and check it out and, and devour it because it feeds our energy. It feeds yeah. our soul. Um, there's a group out of Tokyo I love called Team Lab that does these really amazing interactive experiences that are all media-based. And they're sublime and nuanced in ways that is just hard for uh, people to understand. But... Um, they are taking the world by storm one installation at a time. They started in Tokyo. They've got places in, oh, I think uh, Singapore, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, and now Florida, Miami. Mm. Um, and it, I won't be surprised to see more of them in, in the U.S. soon. Wow. Hmm. Tay, did you have one more kind of in your Greg's well, opinion did you, land? Did you, My, well, I, mine, is, mine is outside of opinion land. <laughs> oh, okay. Then I have one last opinion land yes. question. Sure, go ahead. So uh, this is probably going to be similar to the question I just asked you. Um, <laughs> do, you think, do you think that... I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I'm just curious. Do you think that Disney will ever have an agreement with anybody else like they did with Oriental Land Company? Or is that like a one and done... They want to operate their own stuff. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah, I love that question. That's a great question because I love that agreement we have with OLC. I think it's a fabulous agreement. Well, you'd wow. think Disney would like it too because it's it gets their name out there and they get 
they get paid licensing, I assume, for it. And the other people, like, pick up the bill for the thing, basically. <laughs> it, and, and again, here I am talking about something I'm really ill-equipped to talk yep. about. Right? That's why so it's I, opinion land. It's opinion <laughs> land only. What I see with Oriental Land Company and with Japan is so unique. And I'm not sure it can be replicated. Hmm. Um, OLC, in many ways, is more Disney than Disney. Hmm. They care so much about the product. They care so much about the quality that they, they've they taken what we've taught them and what we've shown them to be the way we do things at Disney. And they have, they have strived to perfect it and do it better than anybody else. They have such a pride in what they do. So that agreement that says, oh, we'll see, this is your money. You're going to license us, our characters, our name, our IP. We are going to design. You're going to do all the hard work. Because um, truly they do, right? I mean, mm-hmm. our, our job, when you work on a, on a project with OLC, the easy job is, is the design. The hard parts, the implementation, the operation afterwards. Um, now, a lot of my colleagues right now are also writing me nasty emails going, Greg, do you know how hard it is to work with OLC? Do you, have you? <laughs> I, yes, I know. I sat in all yeah. the video conferences until odd hours of the night. And I've sat in all those meetings with interpreters where it takes twice as long to get your point across because you're having to interpret everything from Japanese Mm -hmm. to English and English to Japanese. And so, yes, I know all that, but still they OLC does a lot of heavy lifting. They do an amazing job and it would take lightning striking again to find another I'm not saying it's a cultural thing. I'm just saying it's a company thing. That company decided that that was an important thing to them, and they wanted that. And so we would have to find somebody else somewhere who said, this product, this company of Disney is important to us, and we want to preserve it and maintain it as well as you do. Um, I don't know how you do that today. I, yeah. And I don't know that we knew we were doing it when it happened. You know... OLC approached us in the 60s and asked us to build Tokyo Disneyland. And we sent, them, we sent them packing and said, go away. We're busy. We, we have no time for you. And they kept coming back and coming mm-hmm. back and coming back and coming back and persisted and said, we're not going to rest until you guys <laughs> give us the go ahead. So finally in the 70s, they said, all right, we just finished Walt Disney World. That's done and open. We're thinking about this thing called Epcot, but we'll figure out how to shoehorn you guys in. So (laughs) very much the same way DCA and TDS got built at the same time, Mm -hmm. Epcot and TDL got built at the same time. They were parallel projects, and a whole bunch of people got their career chance on TDL because the A team got put on Epcot. And I, and I say that, and everybody on TDL now is going to write me a nasty letter. Like, you know, I'm not, I was part of the A-team, right? But truly, the the people that had been around a while and the people that, that were the most experienced were all working on Epcot. And the company signed this deal to do Tokyo Disneyland. And a whole bunch of people who had never been to Japan before and didn't know anything about Japan were suddenly getting in a sign. And then the company started recruiting Imagineers left and right to find people who could work on Tokyo Disneyland. And the conceit they had at the time was, well, you know what we'll do? We'll just take the Magic Kingdom drawings out of the drawer. We'll lift that. We'll make some changes and we'll give them Magic Kingdom. And, and that's what they tried to do. And then it morphed into this thing that became Tokyo Disneyland and lightning struck. Lightning struck, and I don't think anybody knew. I, if anybody says they knew it was going to happen, I don't. I think they're lying. I, <laughs> I don't think anybody knew lightning was going to strike the way it did, but it did, and and it's turned into the most popular park in the port in all of Disney. Right? I mean, Tokyo Disneyland, Disney Sea, are more popular than any of our other destinations, and and I say that also. And there's probably others who are going to argue with me too, but I can tell you, no, they're the most popular. <laughs> it you know it's it's really incredible when you like think about it because Disney had to just kind of put a lot of faith, hope, and pixie dust into this into you know the Oriental Land Company. 
there was no there this, was, you know what i mean it's just oh, like but there was here's no, our no like, risk right the company had no yeah. risk other than their brand which yep, they were yep. like well you know we will tell them to close if it's terrible that's right? true if they don't yep, do that's job. true but we're not putting any money up we're that's not true. it's not a dime of disney money is going into this it's all theirs they want to take the risk okay fine well that's that's a that's a good way of saying it i always think yeah. of the whole like we're going to hand you this very special thing. Please don't break it. <laughs> that oh, kind of and, and, you know? and you're absolutely right, Teresa. <laughs> I mean, the brand identity, the, the, you, you can't restore people's trust once you break it. Yeah. So we always take that very seriously. Mm-hmm. We can't, mm-hmm. we can't ruin the trust that people have in us. And we understand how important that is. But I mean, I'm sure I wasn't around then, right. When they made those deals, but I'm sure they felt like the risk was very small. Yeah. Um, well, and I think the fact that the Oriental Land Company was so persistent, kept coming, at, you know, kept coming, kept mm-hmm. coming, that also probably made Disney go, well, these guys are pretty, like, they're not going away. They really, like, yeah. this is a deep, deep desire, deep want, need, whatever you want to call it. Like, right. this is a big, big, big deal for them, and they're not going to take no for an answer. I'm sure that spoke volumes to them as well. I, I'm sure it did. I, I'm sure it did. That kind of earnestness and, and, you know, having experienced that firsthand and working with then the successors in that company and how much that carried forward with everybody who works there, how much they still to this day believe in it. it it's awe-inspiring. And it's why it was my favorite place to work. Because when I worked there, I felt like I was just part of this like-minded community who all cared deeply about the product. And it just was a joy, uh, an absolute joy to be part of that. My last question before we wrap up with our final question, I feel like we can't have been talking about Tokyo Disneyland without mentioning Duffy. Oh. And I Duffy is I don't understand I, Duffy at all. I, I will tell you I don't know very much about Duffy, but Duffy fascinates me because Duffy is to us, you know, this unknown character, but so much popularity, has a whole group of friends now, and it's very unique. To, they tried to, to bring him to DCA for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that didn't go well, did it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Though Duffy is a unique phenomenon. And yeah. again, I think lightning struck in Japan in ways that I don't... I, I mean, I think there's some popularity in Hong Kong and Shanghai, but mm-hmm. um, really Tokyo is the home of Duffy and, and the home of Duffy's friends. Now, mm-hmm. Duffy got its start actually in Walt Disney World. It was originally called oh. the Disney Bear. And oh. there, was a, there was a whole backstory on the Disney bear... Um, I believe it was Mickey's bear that he brought to the Magic Kingdom with him because he was lonely. Now, sure. stop and think about that for a second. Mickey lonely? <laughs> I'm really like, hang yeah. on, hang on. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I, I'm yeah. probably making somebody mad somewhere who, who <laughs> loved that It seems story. like you love that, apparently. <laughs> right. But, but the idea was that Mickey went to the Magic Kingdom and, and mm-hmm. was enjoying his experience and wish he had some friends to share his experience with. And then Tinkerbell heard Mickey's thoughts and came down and sprinkled pixie oh. dust on the bear and brought the bear to life. Right. That I think I'm probably screwing the story up <laughs> royally, but that was my Something understanding along those of it. Lines. Yeah. So I was okay. actually living in Tokyo when this all came up. And um, so there was a merchandise director at the time by the name of Ed Storr and great guy who was over there in, in Tokyo as the merchandise leader. And he knew of the Disney bear in Florida and he, in watching guests interactions in the parks and understanding um, uh, the experience in Japan, he thought the Disney bear would do very well um, because it's a beautiful plush bear, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really well-made, it's, you know, just a, a, a just an, Nice bear, right? And so he came to us at WDI and said, hey, I want to bring this bear, but I know you guys can help me craft a story around it and give it a place to live. Maybe give it a little bit more meaning. And I thought that was very smart to do that because I think whether that was Ed's idea originally or somebody else's, I don't know. But all I know is by doing that, it put a sense of importance and it gave the bear a sense of meaning to the Japanese audience that helped it resonate and in, in ways that we just didn't understand at the time. Now, at that time I was working SQS, Joel and Cicero was the creative executive in charge of Tokyo. And so Joe had a 
writer and some some folks in in Glendale come up with a story, and they create a little storybook about Duffy the uh, Dis- Duffy the bear, and that the story was that. Uh, we were going to put the bear in Cape Cod, which is one of the little lands, kind of a, almost a subland to American waterfront in Tokyo Disney Sea. And in Cape Cod, Mickey is a fisherman, and mm-hmm. Mickey would go out on these fishing voyages. And so Minnie made a bear for Mickey to keep him company on his voyages. And Mickey would dream at night about the bear coming to life and they would go on these fantastic adventures together. And then he would wake up and there would be the bear sitting there and he wouldn't know, did I dream that or did it really happen? So this was all in this little storybook that was created by Joe and his team. And then Joe came to us and said, Hey, let's find a place for it and figure out how we do it. So there was a retail shop in Cape Cod called Aunt Pegs that nobody went to. And sold a bunch of merchandise <laughs> that nobody cared about because it was all like New Englandy, you know, sure. Harbor stuff. And and the Japanese <laughs> were like, "Why do we care about this? This is this means nothing to us." And we had all kinds of different ideas. Like we were going to make it a build a bear experience, you know, where you made your own oh. Duffy and then you know took that out. And that became too complicated, and so we just said, "Well, let's just introduce Duffy here," and we put a little storybook with him that got sold with the bear. None of us thought this was going to work. And by the way, OLC hated the idea. Can I tell you that? <laughs> and, and I hope OLC is listening to me telling me this story right now because they, to this day, they claim credit, right? They say, well, we love Duffy. We always yeah. thought Duffy was fantastic. And I'm telling you right now, they hated it. They thought this was a stupid idea. <laughs> and and they were like, we'll give you a couple of shelves in the merchandise shop, but that's it. And you guys are idiots for thinking that this is going to work. Like, Good luck with this. <laughs> right? And, and honestly, I didn't think it was that great of an idea myself at the time, right? I was like, well, it's cute, it's fine, but I don't, you know. I and then it, it took off. And then the next thing I know, everybody had to have a bear. And not just the bear, you had to have the clothes. And because we couldn't keep merchandise in stock, they started making their own clothes for Duffy. And then <laughs> it it grew this whole way of interacting with Duffy, where Duffy took on a life of its own, where we had to start creating high chairs in restaurants for people to put their Duffy in. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. So wow. that when you would dine at the restaurant, you had to have yeah. a place for your Duffy to sit to experience your meal with you. Or yeah. when you went to see a live show, Duffy mm-hmm. would, would occupy a seat with you. So Duffy Duffy essentially became a family member Yeah. and would experience the park with you. And then we created photo ops throughout the park where you could place your Duffy and you could get your picture taken with you and Duffy experiencing wow. the park together. Wow. This, Duffy's even like bigger than I, I realized. Oh, I knew it, I knew Duffy was popular, but wow. Yeah, I, I, I've i been gone from the company since 21, so I don't have the current numbers. Sure. But um, I can tell you it was a significant share of the overall merchandise sales for wow. Japan. And Japan sells more Disney merchandise than all domestic parks combined. So when you think about that for a second and you think about yeah. how big, Duffy is a significant um, player and, it, wow. you know, probably more important to the Japanese parks than Mickey and Minnie. Um, certainly more so than Winnie the Pooh or any of the other wow. characters. Mm-hmm. And and it's a really an amazing phenomenon, which I don't mm-hmm. know can be replicated anywhere else. Right. It, it is uniquely Tokyo Disney Sea. It's not mm-hmm. sold in Tokyo Disneyland. The, the, oh. the bears the only, it only, and this is OLC, bless their hearts. They are, they do Disney better than Disney. <laughs> they say this bear exists only in Tokyo Disney Sea. The friends only exist in Tokyo Disney Sea. There's only one place you can get it. That's in Tokyo Disney Sea. Can't get it in Disneyland. Yeah. Not there. Wow. Doesn't wow. exist. That See, Teresa, there's your, there's your thing. Cause you were saying that you like when Disney only puts things in like See? one place. I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You I just like, need to I go like, hang out with Oriental to Land Company. Yep, I like right. the uniqueness of each park, and I want each park to have to be unique because that's why it's special. And so, yeah, there, there you go, right there. Wow, wow, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing the story and the background of Duffy. Duffy is so yeah. much more than I, I. I knew Duffy was popular, and I knew Duffy mm-hmm. was very special. 
to the Tokyo parks, but I did not, or well, to Tokyo Disney Sea now specifically. So much yeah. so I didn't that realize they've, it. Even, wow. they've even now started to create animation shorts that they show only in Have Japan that, that are Duffy and Friends. Wow. And, That's amazing. Uh, and, and the stories are being written by Imagineers. Yeah. So That's Charlie cool. Watanabe, who's a show writer for Imagineering and uh, uh, from Japan originally and uh, writes for now the Tokyo Portfolio, has been writing shorts for um, uh, for Duffy and Friends. And wow. they're brilliant. They're absolutely brilliant. That kind of, wow. We kind of just went full circle. We were talking about IP versus, yeah. you know, an original thought. And look at how that original thought just was kind of a, well, we'll see. And bam. Mm. Dang. Very cool. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I feel like they're... I mean, we could talk for another two or three hours, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but we'll end this conversation here because yeah. I feel like it's getting late for everybody. Sure. And So we'll get to our last question, which is, if you could work at Disneyland, what would you do? So the sky's the limit. could be any job, even a made-up one. What would you do? Uh, that's, I love that question. I, I, that's probably my favorite one. Um, <laughs> I had a good friend of mine who was also... He and I started in show set together, uh, David Emister. And David used to tell me his favorite job was... Because I don't know if you guys know, we used to do for Christmas, they used to close the park and Imagineering would get the park to themselves, right? Oh. Now, when we would do that, they would ask if some of the Imagineers could come down and work some of the rides, be cast members, right? To also, you know, give the Disneyland cast members a break and not yeah. let them have to work those hours. And we were always, we loved that. We were like, oh my God, yes, let us, <laughs> I want to be a ride op or I want to work in, in an attraction or something. Well, my friend David, he always wanted to be a custodian on Main Street. That was his favorite job. And I stopped and I thought about that. I'm like, what a cool thing, right? Because you're part of creating this ambiance mm -hmm. of a place. You're giving life to it by being that person who is there, you know, sweeping up the trash, but interacting with the guests, mm -hmm. creating this whole sense of place in that. And, and I loved David's uh, articulation of that. I thought that was so cool. But I never got to do that. I, you know, I actually, when I volunteered, they just assigned me to something. And um, I ended up being a ride operator on the Mark Twain. Mm. And I have to say, I loved it. It was so much fun because now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a little, I don't know if this is a secret or not. Magic but spoiler, the, magic spoiler, magic, magic spoiler. spoiler. <laughs> the uh, cast members who work there on a regular basis, they called it the floating break room because, <laughs> because really once you launch from the, true. from the dock, you've got a nice 15 minute break, right? Mm -hmm. That's going around the river. Now, you know, they would make announcements and stuff and they yeah. would, they would have some fun with the guests and stuff like that. But it was so lovely and relaxing. And you just got to sit back and enjoy the scenery going around Rivers of America. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> this is really a pretty cool, cool job. So the floating I have to, breaker. I have to say Mark Twain, Rivers of America. And what I mean, it's such a beautiful beautiful area of the park too you know the rivers oh, yes of gosh. course but then looking yeah. out over you know Orleans square watching the logs come crashing well, not crashing down come splashing <laughs> down splash Mountain. don't say that to the five-year-old no, no 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 <laughs> yeah so it, it is it's it's very it's a very well and it's a very unique perspective you know i'm sure a lot of people would be like oh i'd love to be a, a you know in indiana jones or i'd love to be in a hunt mansion or something like that but those are those are high pressure jobs Right. I mean, you're and I'm not saying that there's not pressure on the Mark Twain. Right. But but I mean, when you're responsible for an e-ticket mm -hmm. that, you know, has very tight dispatch intervals and there's safety concerns and loading and loading guests and in, in the frequency that they do. Wow. That's <laughs> bless her hearts. Those folks are that's <laughs> hard. And and so I love those sublime moments, those moments where you can just sit back and relax and just enjoy the experience. You know, whether I'm a custodian on Main Street or I'm um, or the Mark Twain, and I'm just enjoying being. Mm -hmm. Right. That is that to me is what's beautiful about the park. Our poor little hearts were so broken because we found we found out that you can <clears throat> you can get up into the the 
wheelhouse or whatever yeah. like one you know before the pandemic right you know one one family or group could go up there per you know right. rotation or whatever right. that's so magical that they do we that. came in and the cast members like you have to find the captain i'm like well what does the captain look like they're like you gotta find the captain <laughs> and <clears throat> we found it's the like captain like two seconds after this other person yeah. had found the captain and got to go up and so i just remember being so heartbroken because there was oh. that, and then there was the time we tried to get on the Lily Bell, but they were just taking it out of service or something, and it was just no. like, oh, we just missed it. Like, I don't know. Oh. We have poor luck with these things, I think. But oh. I'm sorry. Keep That's all right. It'll Don't happen eventually. Yeah. yeah, eventually That's it'll be cool. That's what makes them special magicals, that it's, it's, a, it's a rare occurrence to be able to experience yeah. and do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your day to talk with us and share your stories. They were incredible and oh, we really pleasure. enjoyed our time oh I, I i love this i you wind me up and you get me going i'll talk all <laughs> night so ha- happy to do it love you guys I, we we you know imagineers we love the passion that we engender in the people mm-hmm. who come to the parks and so for for what you guys provide we just absolutely love that we we think that's terrific and it makes us feel like we're doing our job right you guys are incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, I mean, you create so many happy memories oh, I mean, yeah. for everybody. You know, it's just, it's, you create it's magic. what a job, what a job to be able to be part of something that is going to be like an indelible th- thing on so many people's, yeah. in so many people's minds. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and believe me, we know how special it is. And, and I, I think I speak for all, anybody who's ever been an Imagineer, we, you know, we just cherish that. It's what makes us so special is we, we take that very seriously. It's almost like a, a responsibility. It's like, oh, my God, we, we're part of something that's much bigger than us, right? We're just a small little part of, of um, a much bigger thing. Looks like we're coming in for a landing, gang. But please stay listening until trivia comes to a stop. And then you can walk to the nearest exit. Thanks for listening to the eighth wonder of the world. Dio Weekly. Welcome back to Trivia Land, where we're going to find out the answers to those questions from before. Which which I'm sure we didn't <laughs> I give. don't think we gave now, them to you, no. Now that we've heard the questions, how do we feel about how we did tonight? <laughs> Awful. 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 <laughs> I'm going to like be so excited if we got like a full question right. I don't even know. Even those two-parters, I'm not even confident we got a full oh, yeah. two-parter. Well, well I can tell you this, Teresa, you will be excited then. Oh, I think, I think our only hope is the Haunted Mansion holiday. <laughs> your only hope, probably. <laughs> well, your only hope is that. Well, let's dive into it then, shall we? Your first listener submitted question from listener Chris Y. What is the name of the pirate in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride who offers rum to the cats? Teg said, Drunk Pete. And Teresa said, Drunk Dave. The correct answer that we were looking for was... Old Bill. Old Bill. Yep, I did not know that. Descriptor and a common name. Old Bill. Old Bill. Hmm. Yep. Well, wasn't the guy's name from the movie William something? Probably. I feel like there's probably a lot of William. William was... Was Orlando Bloom's character. But I think there was more... Anyway, doesn't matter. (laughs) Your second regular round question submitted by listener Keith N., what is a common cast member nickname for the Main Street vehicles? Tag said, Funiculars, <laughs> and Teresa said, The Wheels. The correct answer that we were looking for, taken from the book Secret Stories of Disneyland by Jim Corcus, the cast members call them the Germmobiles. Germmobiles. Ooh, makes me think a little differently about riding in a Main Street vehicle. Make sure you bring your, uh, make sure you bring your hand sanitizer and what? the Germmobiles. Huh? Think about how many people go That's on and any off attraction of those vehicle, and... though. That's true. Yeah, but <laughs> I would also say that attraction vehicles. Probably I have more guests than them than the mm-hmm. Main Street vehicles, but yes. That's that's what the book <laughs> says, apparently. <laughs> Your third regular round question submitted by Louise B. In the Haunted Mansion Holiday Overlay, what replaces Madame Leota's musical instruments, and how many objects are there? Teg said there were six fortune cards... And Teresa said there are 13 cards with a couple Nightmare Before Christmas characters. (laughs) 
The correct answer that I was looking for is 13 tarot cards, which is basically a fortune card Mm -hmm. with Nightmare Before Christmas characters on them. Good job. So we get it? I gave Tag half credit for getting tarot cards, fortune cards, and I gave Teresa full credit for 13 cards with Nightmare characters. Woohoo! Good job. That was our one hope. Good job, Teresa. (laughs) And your fourth and final regular round question from listener Cooper C. When was the Fred Gurley number three engine built? And what was its original job before coming to Disneyland? Teg said 1893 and Teresa said 1863. And you both said for hauling lumber. The correct answer that we were looking for was... Built in 1894, oh, the Fred oh, oh. Gurley number no. three was a switch engine on the Godchow Sugar Company mill before mill? being purchased by Disney in 1957. Sugar Company. So is it a, a lumber mill? No, it's a, a sugar, sugar mill. company sugar mill. mill. Dang it. I just heard mill and got excited. I was excited. off by a year. That was pretty darn good. I, I will give Tag half credit Woo! for being off by only a year. Mm-hmm. Good job. So I have one point and you have one point. Mm-hmm. Yes. Woo! You have a very generous one point. <laughs> All right. And our bonus. Maybe this can give us our extra I point. Your bonus so. question provided by listener Cooper C. How much was the Fred Gurley number three purchased for in $1957? Tag said $7,000 in 1957. dollars And Teresa said $20,000 <laughs> in 1957. dollars the correct answer that I was looking for was one thousand two hundred dollars. Oh, oh my gosh, twelve hundred dollars! Wow, I know it was I know it was nineteen fifty seven, but think about how much money they spent to build the entire. That's park. true. So I feel like twelve hundred for an engine is wow. But for a piece of history that is still around. No, no, no. But I mean, like, I feel like that's low. I yeah, really would have thought too. that would have been higher. No, true. No, no, no. They got a deal. I guess they were I, probably scrapping it. I guess I don't know the value of engines. Yeah, I, I would have thought higher. Well, listeners, how do you feel about how they did? How do you feel about how you did at home? Do you think you, you've got the perfect question that can really stump them next week? If you think you've got that perfect question, feel free to send that in to us at trivia at dlweekly.net. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. Until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us. And we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly.